Welcome to Digital Asset News, the top stories in cryptocurrency-digital assets, and I'll bring them down to bite-sized pieces today. Interesting stuff. First up, this is from the Pomp Podcast. He had Brad Garlinghouse on as far as crypto regulation, and there is one specific piece at 15 minutes and 58 seconds where Brad and Pomp talk about Chinese mining pools versus miners and how it's going to affect the entire globe also. Bitcoin price dives back under 16.9, almost down to 16.3. As whale deposits spike again, we're going to take a look at what's going to happen with all these whale deposits and what that usually means, it's not good. Also, the project that will not die, Facebook will reportedly launch Libra Crypto early next year. What that means for me, you, and the entire cryptocurrency universe. And before we get into that, let's go into uh, what's going on with the market. But before we get into the market, let's talk about the audio setup. So I'm doing a little bit of something different. Yesterday, it sounded pretty good. I did a little bit of a uh, tweak. So let me know how the audio sounds later. And uh, maybe we'll keep one of these three. All right. So it is Friday, November 27th. It is 3.30 p.m. I'm trying to get this done so I can... Uh, Check out uh, my man Alex Maschioli's show. He's going to talk about Ripple and Stellar's uh, are cashing in, <laughs> obviously. But uh, what do we got? Well, I'm going to go over this very quickly. Bitcoin's down. Uh, everything else is down pretty much, except for XRP. XRP is up to 55 cents. Now, I think it was all the way up to 70 cents at one point, but uh, there we go. Stellar's up 17. Man, 130% for the week. Good job, Stellar holders. And then uh, 3% for NEM and 16%. Hey, 16% for Celsius Network. Fantastic. Also, I want to take a look at something else. On CoinGecko, most all of them, you can uh, filter this out to take a look at uh, Bitcoin. Because what we're just looking at was everything denominated into the US dollar. Now, if you look at everything from Bitcoin, it's a little bit weird to look at. But I think as time goes on, maybe this is how everybody will look at everything. We're going to take a look at a a car and say, well, how much, how much is that in Bitcoin? Well, that's 340,000 Satoshi, sir, or whatever it is. I don't know idea, but I just thought it'd be interesting to take a look. So, uh, of course, Bitcoin's at zero because it's, everything's denominated in zero. Uh, everything's denominated in Bitcoin. So we got XRP up 6.4, 0.5, for Stellar, 140% as far as it goes to Bitcoin. That's interesting. 0 0.8, 0 0.3, 0.9 for Tezos. So actually, if you look at things with Bitcoin and not as the dollar per se, things are up not as much like even celsius but it's just a different way to look at things but again who knows what we're going to look at in the future so uh maybe we should get used to it all right that's what's going on the market let's jump into today's stories so here's the story morning glory this is what's going on with the palm podcast and it was a really good uh, solid episode as usual uh and it was about 35 minutes so it's, it's not too terribly long but there was one piece i want everybody to listen to this just to see where we're at because brad and everybody over at Ripple has been saying, I mean, first of all, Brad wants Bitcoin to succeed. He wants all of cryptocurrency to succeed. I actually stole that whole, uh, you know, as the water rushes in, uh, all the boats rise. I stole that from Brad. He seems like a great guy. But uh, there's this part here, and it almost sounds like he's making the rounds and saying the same types of things. And I know some people who love XRP are screaming at the uh, <laughs> screen right now, but that the, the questions have to have to be asked. I mean, on, on this show, I'm not going to give anybody a pass. Anybody. When I had Alex on, I don't give him a pass. When I had Steve on from Voyager, I don't give him. I don't give anybody a pass. Even Brad. So when he's talking about things, I got to ask the question. So we're going to take a, a listen to the whole piece here. It's about three and a half minutes wrong, and Brad's going to say that China controls the mining and they can do anything they want with Bitcoin. And we're going to break it down. So let's listen. Where well, the Chinese Communist Party certainly has, if not control, heavy influence. I mean, again, I'll, I'll digress to simply point out, when Ant Financial, the largest IPO in history, is delayed by the Chinese Communist Party, let's not pretend that if the Chinese Communist Party wants to provide control or oversight in some way of these concentrated miners in China. I think that's not, that's not realistic. And again, I'm not necessarily even saying, let's just acknowledge it and let's decide, okay, does it matter? Is it critical? Let, let's, let's not pretend it's not there. Let's acknowledge it's there. And like, well, what are the but, but hold on a second. So there's a difference though between could they exert influence over miners that are a minority part of the network, right? Versus- oh, they're not a minority. Of course they are. There's, there's nobody who's got 50 plus percent control. Four miners in China have well over 50% control. But that's 200%. No, sorry, the, the, the combination of four miners have over 50% control. 
Yeah, well, no, they, they- so I have to stop because that's pretty funny. <laughs> that's pretty funny because Brad was looking at uh, Pomp like, what are you talking about? I just explained it to you. It was, it was pretty funny. But so Pomp missed an opportunity here to really delineate about what Brad is talking about. Is Brad talking about miners? There's four miners that control everything? No, no, no. That's, that's not what he's saying. There's four mining pools. And there is a big difference between a mining pool and miners. How many miners make up a mining pool? Well, there's a thousands of them because that's just how it goes. And I have, I was under this assumption too that since all the mining pools are in China, that China controls everything. But since I've been talking to miners on this channel, uh, they've told me, uh, Rob, you're wrong. You are wrong. And I'm like, oh, I guess I am. And they, they told me like, look, I can connect uh, to any mining pool I want to at any time. But there are caveats to that. And we're going to get into We're gonna, really going to delve into it. But Pomp missed an opportunity to say, are you talking about mining pools or miners? Because then we need to break down that argument even further. That's all I want to say. Let's keep going. They've got over 50% of the mining hash power, but they don't have control of Bitcoin, right? It's not like the Chinese Communist Party can change anything or do anything. They, there are miners, but of if course. If you control a majority of the hash power, the miners are the masters. If you control a majority of the hash power, you know, we have seen 51% attacks on other blockchains. If the Chinese Communist Party, I mean, if what you're saying is you don't think the Chinese Communist Party could go to those four miners and say... Hey, you need to do X, Y, and Z. I mean, I would, I'll ask you: Is that is that the position that you're? Well, you're I, I'm trying to understand what your argument is in terms of you're saying that the Chinese Communist Party has the ability to essentially 51 percent attack the Bitcoin network. One for sure they do. Oh, I, I disagree with that for sure. Well, All right, hold on. It, so wait, 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 wait. Time out. Time out. Time out. Time out. Time okay, out. so this is where it starts to get a little bit dicey, but. So what Pomp is, is saying is, I think Pomp's a little bit confused on this one. I could be wrong, but he's saying, oh, you're telling me that, that these four can control everything? He's like, no, that, that's, that's, that's not true. But in reality, in reality, here's the thing. If all the miners that connected to those mining pools were located in China, then yes, that's totally true. That's 100% true. They could do whatever they want to. The Chinese Communist Party reigns supreme, obviously, right? But here's the thing. Here's, here's the catch. All the miners that connect to those mining pools, to Antpool and BTC.com and all the different ones, they all don't live in China. So it's not like the Chinese Communist Party can tell a miner who is in Grand Prairie, Texas, or a miner who is in X, some, uh, British Columbia, Canada, or who is in the Netherlands to, hey, we're going to you know, do a 51% attack. Now there's a caveat again. If the Chinese Communist Party said to all these, these four mining pools and said, hey, since everybody's connected now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a 51% attack and we're going to screw up the whole network. We're going to collapse it and it's going to be an economic turmoil. Could they do that before all the miners figure it out? That's the question. That's, that is the question. And... I would have to say that a number of miners probably don't sit there and watch everything that's going on. And they may be a part of that attack. But what would happen if that did happen? Because you've got all these miners who were like, you know, all throughout the globe, all throughout the world. They're saying, okay, uh, China just did a 51% attack. They did double spend. They reversed transactions. Uh, they screwed up the whole network. Now I can't mine Bitcoin because it's going to collapse for a while, for a while. So they would just disconnect and they would go someplace else. Would the entire Bitcoin network go down and it would never recover? That's the question. I don't think it, that would actually happen. I think uh, just like, I'll, I'll give you an example. And this is a poor example, but it's still, still an example. Ethereum Classic, they've had three 51% attacks, three. And they are still in the top uh, 35, 40, somewhere around there. They haven't collapsed. Now, Ethereum Classic is not Bitcoin in any way, shape, or form. Let's just be honest about that. However, if it did happen, um, could it collapse and totally never recover? I, I don't know. Would it actually happen? I just don't think it would. I don't think that the Chinese Communist Party would say, we want to totally wipe this out because what's going to happen then? Well, all those pools, they're all done for. I mean, they can start to mine other types of cryptocurrencies, but the question would be, what is the what is the end game? What is the point? 
because if America, I mean, let's be honest, China and America are bad, are butting heads this whole time. So if they want to do anything, it's all about economic control. So if they did that, would that collapse the economic power that is the, the United States? I don't think that would actually would happen. I think it would it would destroy some companies here and throughout the whole globe. I just don't see that actually going on. So again, the question is, are you talking about mining pools or individual miners? And then it gets even deeper than that because you have to ask, ask the question, well, in these mining pools, they also own mining rigs. How many mining rigs do they own? They're not going to tell you. They're in China. <laughs> it's not, it's not going to happen, right? So you have that prospect. And also, how many miners live in China as opposed to living in Dubuque, Iowa, that opposed to living in Chihuahua, Mexico, that opposed to living in, and name your country and state. So how do we know that? Well, we don't know that. We only know the hash power and we know the mining pools that exist. We don't know how many miners are there. I don't believe personally that that is actually the case, that that actually happens. And people say, ah, oh, you're naive because China owns everything. I, I, just, I don't think they own everything. I think it's a lot more complex than that. And it's uh, beyond my pay grade. I just don't believe that right now that China would just destroy everything at the drop of a hat. But again, I think Pomp missed an opportunity to really delve into this subject and really parse things and break them apart. All right, let's keep going. Right, put a pin. Hold on, pause. <laughs> we, you, I know you well enough, and I think you know me well enough. We're not going to change each other's mind on this. So just oh, put a pin I, in that I, one. Oh, well, let, let me ask two questions. Okay. Do you think the Chinese Communist Party could, if they wanted to, control those four miners? No. But they can control the IPO of the largest. I mean, like by comparison. Well, of, course, of course. No, what, what they can do is they can shut the miners down. Right. But like the Chinese Communist Party does not control Ant Financial in terms of make the business decisions. What they did is they stopped the listing on an exchange, of course, but they control the exchange. So they don't I, control Ant Financial. If I come back to you with like maybe five examples where the Chinese Communist Party has actually made decisions at a more micro level, then but, you would like, but, but here's, here's a good example. Hold on. If you use yeah. the Ant Financial example, right, that would be like me saying that the SEC controls Ripple. Right, because well, first of all, if you just compared the Chinese Communist Party to the Trump administration, <laughs> to the SEC, <laughs> okay. well, look, I, I don't believe that a comparison to how the U.S. government works and how the Chinese government works is a. I no, I know. That, I will, that's my, totally my, point, my point being that uh, when Ant Financial goes to conduct the IPO, right, it's very, very well documented that uh, Jack Ma said some things that sounds like it pissed off the CCP, and there was whether directly or indirectly. Uh, you're not going to take the company public right now, right? Was it a decision made and that was sure. executed? The, yeah. the Why it happens is besides the point, it's just the fact that, yes, they stopped that from happening. That is, in my opinion, no different than if an outside regulatory body or the government stops you from listing on an exchange or doing something. Now, I think where people have the problem is why it happened, right? Like imagine if you were trying to conduct business and if you said something that you know, upset somebody, then they would come after you type situation. That wouldn't be a, a good business environment to operate in. But let's go all the way back for a second. Right. So if... Okay, so from right there, they just, he kind of skirts around it and goes something else, and that's fine. I, I'm not here for that. So it was just an interesting conversation, and there's a lot of different moving pieces to that. One is I don't think that some people realize the nefariousness and the devious nature uh, that can be China and how they will do whatever it takes for economic and total control, not just of their own people, but of everyone around them and global domination. That's the whole point. So the question really is, is why do these individual miners ever hook into the mining pool on all these mining pools, which are like, I think it's like 60% now that is in China. And the reason is because it's cheap electricity, right? All the miners tell me the same thing. Our job is to mine Bitcoin at the cheapest electricity because that's the highest overhead. So if that's the case, then you want to go where it's cheap and it's cheap over there. However, things are changing a little bit because we have layer one coming up that is backed by billionaire Peter Thiel. And they are looking at getting uh, wind power that can get them less than one cent per kilowatt hour. And this is growing. They're supposed to be expanding uh, up to this year. And what they're looking at is to have m the Bitcoin mining come into 
the US and also Canada between 20 to 30 percent of, of the hash power that is so as time goes on I think there'll be a little bit more of a or less of a monopoly and that is a good thing for everybody this was supposed to be decentralized and right now you've got mining pools all located over there and then another big argument was what well, you don't understand it's because all the ASIC miners or all the miners have the ASICs motherboards and that is what controls it so you have to go through China for the motherboards so I have a hard time believing that America which gave us Google Apple, Amazon, Tesla, name your big tech company, can't come up with a way to manufacture better motherboards than China. And now that we're getting into this big race and we're getting into the, all these institutions coming in and you get to all these different government agencies, I mean, the SEC and the OCC just put out a press statement about custody. Do you think they won't be looking at this a little bit more and going, you know what, this really is an issue of national security, especially as other countries are adding Bitcoin to their treasuries. Do you not think that this won't be the next big space race? Let me know what you think in the comment section, but there's one more piece, and that is that there's two more interesting pieces that they talked about. One was Brad was, and he was right, he was right. He, he was ticked off of the fact that uh, the SEC and the CFTC came down and said, hey, you know what, Bitcoin, Ethereum, they're good to go, uh, they're not a security. And it gave him the green light, and it put the handcuffs on Ripple and XRP, because he's, he talks about it, he says, you know what, we've got all these different institutional customers, and if we could just get regu regulatory clarity because he says, I sit down with the CEOs, with the bank managers and everybody, and they say, hey, we're using Ripple and we love it, but we can't use XRP because we don't know it's going to be a security. And then he's like, you know, if we could just not have the security, we would really blow it up. And I think that's true. I think if they if somebody would come down and say, okay, it's not a security. Well, first they have to go through that lawsuit and that has to get dismissed. So who knows how long that's going to take. And the second thing is then the government has to come out and say it's not a security. So I think once it happened, it could be really great, but who knows until that time. And the second thing is they talk about, well, since there's not that much regulatory clarity, he goes, uh, as far as like Ripple, you know, we're here in the United States, but 90% of our XRP and everything else that we do is outside the U.S. So if we want to leave, we'll leave and we have no problems. And he did talk about how he's he's proud to be here and he wants to be in america so he's not like he's from kansas for pete's sakes it's not like he's like anti-american but he's like you know if the government's gonna gonna shackle us we're out of here and i have to agree i think uh they should so anyhow it was a deep conversation and that was just a couple of minutes so go ahead and check that out i'll put the links in the uh, description and let's go on our next piece <laughs>